Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this uh, joint event on examining what a pro-growth corporate tax reform agenda would look like. And uh, I'm Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF, and we're really pleased to be able to co-host this event with my colleague Ike Brannon from the American Action Forum. And uh, Ike is going to present the results of, uh, of his research today and, and recommendation. Well, I'll do the same. Yeah. And we have uh, two uh, commentators. So let me start by introducing folks. And then uh, uh, we should have uh, a good amount of time at the end for questions and discussion. So, uh, Ike is the Director of Economic Policy at the American Action Forum and uh, as well as Director of Congressional Relations. Prior to that, he was the Chief Economist for the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And prior to that, he was the Senior Policy Advisor and Chief Economist for the Republican Policy Committee. Uh, also held that position in the uh, position he held in the uh, John McCain presidential campaign. Before that, Senior Advisor to uh, for Tax Policy uh, for Senator Warren Hatch uh, and a number of other uh, positions. Uh, Robin Barron is the Chief Tax Officer and Director of Global Tax and Trade for Caterpillar. Uh, he, uh, before joining Caterpillar in 1989, or after joining Caterpillar, he became Senior Tax Officer. Uh, he uh, spent 16 years with Price Waterhouse, including two years as Technical Tax Services, uh, and, uh, and he has a long uh, background in tax policy. And finally, Peter Merrill is the Director of National Economics and Statistics Group at Price Waterhouse Coopers. So we have, this is the Price Waterhouse event today. Uh, he uh, is in the National Tax Office, Services Office. Uh, prior to joining uh, uh, PwC in 89, he was Chief Economist at the Joint Committee on Taxation in Congress. Uh, he's also has a long, also a long background in, uh, in tax policy as a PhD in Business Economics from Harvard. So, what I want to talk about today is uh, a new report that we released today that's out there uh, talking about a particular slice of corporate tax reform. Uh, certainly, there's a growing consensus that corporate tax reform is needed, that it should be comprehensive. The real question is what should it look like? Uh, there are a wide array of issues that are involved in that, including how foreign source income is taxed, uh, including differential tax treatment and dividends and interest. But I'm not going to talk about any of those, uh, partly because I wanted to have a more narrowly focused uh, uh, treatment of a couple of other issues. I think Ike is going to raise both of those issues, certainly the foreign source income issue. So I want to focus on really two issues. The first issue is what, what extent should reform focus on this, this sort of meaning now of broadening the base and reducing so-called tax distortions and therefore lowering the statutory rate. And to what extent should reform be revenue neutral? Uh, I would argue that these are critical issues to get right, and we have to have a robust debate that's based upon analysis and logic, uh, not unexamined assumptions. Unfortunately, I would argue that's really not the case, that much of what is passing for analysis today the corporate tax reform is a reflection of what I would call Washington group thing. Uh, there's a view that the best tax code is neutral, it doesn't quote pick winners, uh, and this is now, I would argue, the conventional wisdom. Both parties essentially say it, and it's been said in a way that even questioning it, there must be something the matter with you. President Obama in his State of the Union address this year called on Congress to join with him to quote, get rid of the loopholes, level the playing field, and use the savings to lower the corporate tax rate without adding to our deficit. Uh, Governor Mitt Romney, just about a week ago on the campaign trail, said essentially the same thing. Quote, what I would like to see us do philosophically is to bring our corporate rate down to be competitive with the world, but get rid of those special, tax, those special breaks that exist. Let's get rid of that stuff and bring our rate down. So both parties essentially have embraced this view. The tax code is rife with distortions. These distortions are anti-growth. We should get rid of them, bring the rate down from 35 to something in the mid, perhaps even low 20s. Uh, let me suggest in thinking about this debate that a way, one way to think about it is to realize that there are four main groups, I would argue, or groupings in the tax reform debate. Uh, the first two, I would 
states rep represent the Washington consensus here. And they're what I would call the BBLRs, the broad and the beige, lower the rate groups, so what I just described. Within that, there are really two sort of segments, if you will. Uh, one is I would, what we term the hardcore base broaders. For them, just get rid of every single possible exemption, deduction, distortion, and use that to lower the corporate rate, the statutory rate. Some of those folks actually would argue we should just get rid of the corporate rate 100%, it's just a distortionary, and replace it with some kind of national value added tax. So their view is tax, the cor corporate tax rate in and of itself is distortionary, uh, we should get rid of it. Their view is how could the mar government possibly outguess market actors? Uh, we should just have a really low flat rate uh, that doesn't distort anything, and the lower the rate, the better, because uh, high rates have a uh, dead weight economic loss. Uh, this was largely the thinking behind the 86 Tax Reform Act. It was largely the thinking behind the 2007 Treasury Report, uh, which, of those you recall, that report called for eliminating incentives like accelerated depreciation, uh, special deduction for U.S. production, and the R&D tax credit. There's a second group that's very similar to this group. They're the, what I would call the pragmatic case broaders. For them, you get rid of a lot of those things, but there's a few things in the tax code that are worth keeping. Uh, a good example of them would be John Diamond and George Zodro of the Baker Research Institute in Texas. If you haven't seen their report, it's worth looking at. We cite it. Uh, they're essentially in the base broadening camp, but they would argue there's a few incentives that probably are worth keeping. They say, quote, an essential element of successful tax reform is the elimination of tax-induced distortions uh, other than a few very narrowly defined activities with widespread economic effects, such as investment in research and development. So they keep the R&D credit, but they get rid of mostly everything else. There's a third group that sounds like it's the first, like the first two groups. If you listen to them and don't know who they are, they sound exactly like the first two, except they're fundamentally different. This third group, I would argue, are what are called the progressive tax increasers. These are folks who essentially, they want to get rid of the distortions, they want to get rid of the exemptions, they want GE to pay an effective rate of 35%. Uh, they just also, uh, they just want to use all of those distortions, if you will, and those exemptions. Instead of taking the money to lower the rate, they want to keep the rate the same and take the money and use it for social spending. Uh, the Center for Budget and po Policy Priorities exemplifies this view. Uh, they state, quote, the corporate tax uh, code taxes different kinds of that corporate investments at different rates. This unlevel playing field encourages businesses to choose among investments in substantial part based on their tax benefits. Policymakers should level the playing field. Now, again, for them, leveling the playing field means no more deduction. Everybody pays 35% effective and then use that increased revenues for things like increased social spending. The fourth group which is us, ITIF, and certainly some others, which we would call pragmatic tax incentivists, uh, who view the corporate tax code as a key policy tool. Corporate taxes, like many other policy areas, like regulation, like uh, direct investment in things like science and technology, are key tools. Uh, and therefore, distortions may not be harmful for growth, and if they aren't, we should be expanding them. Now, let me suggest that there's, not, as I said, this ideological basis to this. There's a really wonderful article by Larry Summers, who everybody knows, and Alan Auerbach, well-known tax economist, uh, in 1979 in NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, and they did a study looking at the investment tax credit, uh, which at the time had been a common feature of the U.S. tax code for many, many years, since at least the 1950s, and was seen with, as a kind of consensus view, both Republicans and Democrats like the investment tax credit. Uh, and what Summers and Auerbach did, they did a model using a DRI model, it looked at the impact of uh, the economic growth over the next five years on with an investment tax credit and without. And here's what they found. They found that having an investment tax credit led to more investment in equipment and machinery and factories. Everybody, that's kind of obvious. It does what it, it does what it's supposed to do. It also led to a higher rate of GDP growth. So what did Larry Summers and Alan Auerbach conclude? We should eliminate the investment tax credit. The reason they said that was because it crowded out non-favored investments. So it had a slightly, if you have more demand for capital, a modest increase in interest rates, that led to crowding out of residential housing. <laughs> so 
As a result, Congress eliminated the investment tax credit, and at the same time, they actually expanded residential housing tax credits, and the result is what we've seen, a dramatic decline in U.S. manufacturing capex and a dramatic increase in housing. But that was a good decision, according to them, because they didn't distort, quote, allocation efficiency. The market allocated these things. And for them, as this famous line, potato ships, computer ships, what's the difference? Housing, factories, machine tools, what's the difference? It's all the same. A dollar of housing is worth a dollar of computing in a factory. Uh, in contrast, the Canadian government doesn't seem to have got bought into these kinds of ideological assumptions. Uh, the wonderful Canadian economist at their Treasury Department, Eleb Ab Ayerworth, and he wrote recently, quote, there is no presumption that distortions are necessarily welfare reducing. Uh, distortions that favor the contributors to long-run growth will be welfare enhancing. So the point is, if you distort your tax code through things like accelerated depreciation or R&D tax credits, those are not necessarily welfare uh, detracting, they could be welfare enhancing. That's, by the way, why the Canadians recently uh, in instituted a change in their tax code so companies that invest in new machinery, equipment, and computers can write it off almost within a year and a half to two years. Much, much better than the U.S. They don't mind picking winners. Now, the winners they're picking are investments in uh, productive machinery equipment. So let me suggest three, two, three things, and then I'll stop, that I think our, I, we see as a worry with current tax reform. One, revenue neutrality will not make the U.S. more competitive. There's a view, and almost a consensus now, well, it's okay if the corporate tax code is revenue neutral as long as we're lowering the statutory rate. In other words, companies will still pay the same amount of money, it's just they'll pay it in a different way. Uh, I just don't see how that is the case. Uh, and the only way that could be the case is if somehow multinationals make decisions on the basis of statutory rates rather than effective rates. Now, that means they're not buying Peter Merrill's services because Peter does all these great studies that tell you exactly what the effective rate is by country. Now, unless they're so stupid, they don't know that, and they go, oh, geez, the statutory rate in this country is lower, even though the effective rate is higher. Okay, I, don't, I just simply don't buy that. Uh, the second way that a non-revenue neutral, a revenue neutral tax code could make, could, could spur growth if somehow the things that you got rid of were not spurring growth. As I'll say in a minute, I don't buy that. Uh, the second thing I think that corporate tax reform, if done in the sort of Washington consensus way, would hurt is it would essentially reduce taxes on industries that face significant international competition, like, like a caterpillar, uh, and it would raise them, uh, excuse me, it raise taxes on those industries, and it would lower taxes on industries that have little competition. So in other words, uh, the U.S. economy is made up of two kinds of industries. One are uh, traded sectors. So think about uh, a car factory or a computer factory or a software company. Those are largely traded around the world. They're in competition with countries around the firms in other countries. And then you have things like barber shops and uh, grocery stores, uh, electric utilities, those aren't traded. Now, what every single state in the United States does, every single state, they have lower taxes on their traded sectors than they do on their non-traded sectors. Every single country has lower taxes on their traded sectors than non-traded sectors because they know that if you raise taxes on your traded sectors, you're going to lose jobs in those sectors. Pretty easy. Uh, and yet, the view in the U.S. is every industry should pay exactly the same rate because that's not picking winners. Right now, restaurants pay 20, this is all research, by the way, by Oswath de Madaran at Stern School of Business, you haven't seen the studies we're looking at. Uh, restaurants, the effective rate is 20%, software is 10%, trucking is 31%, metals and mining is 7.4%, electric utilities 32%, precision instruments 10%. So corporate tax reform, if we go with the kind of standard view, software, metals, and precision instruments, their taxes are going to go up. Doesn't matter what you do, all those other things, you can lower the effective rate to 22%, their taxes are going up. Um, the uh, other point of this is there's this view there that somehow this is sort of, uh, this is somehow a good thing. That, President's Recovery Advisory Board. If you haven't seen their report on tax reform that Austin Gould be led is worth looking at. Um, they have a, a little discussion in there of the domestic production deduction. 
this was, as you know, was put in place in, I guess, what, 2004 to replace the Foreign Sales Corporation law, which was ruled illegal by WPO, even though every other country in the world has value-added border adjustable taxes, which give their exporters an advantage and hurt us as importers. So we put in place the domestic production deduction. The President's Recovery Advisory Board uh, says, this would be great, we should, this is a big thing, let's get rid of this. Because if we do, we can lower the overall effective corporate rate from 35% to 34%. Only one problem with that, though, is every manufacturer on average would pay three percentage points higher. So we think about that. We can lower the rate from 35 to 34, and therefore Home Depot and uh, uh, all the law firms in town that are for profit, they're going to pay lower rates. Uh, but Caterpillar would pay three points higher on average. Uh, also, it's interesting, they ridiculed the deduction, basically, if you read that, they said, this deduction is really incredibly kind of, uh, it's not really for production. Hamburgers get it. Hamburger production get it. The reality is 85%, if you look at Treasury data, 85% of those of the, of the firms taking those that domestic production deduction are manufacturers. And only 0.2%, 0.2% are in the food service and accommodation industry. So the reality is this is actually a pretty effective deduction that spurs U.S. competitiveness, but it's at risk of getting lost. Third one, I think one of the big risks of corporate tax reform is it, it's, it's going to, get, it's going to uh, potentially get rid of some critical tax incentives that grow the U.S. economy and make it more competitive. Case in point is the R&D tax credit or the R&D tax credit. This, every study that we can find, and we've done all sorts of work on this, virtually every academic study has shown that the R&D tax credit produces uh, about $1.30 to $2.40 more private sector R&D for every dollar of tax expenditure. And though that R&D leads to higher productivity, it leads to more jobs, and it ultimately leads to higher tax revenues for the federal government. Therefore, we should get rid of it. It's pro-growth, it makes more innovation in the economy, and it helps U.S. firms become competitive, but it picks winners. I actually was on a one, one of these uh, MSNBC shows or some show like that, I was debating some guy, and he said, oh, the R&D tax credit is industrial policy. It's picking winners. Like, that is a pretty broad definition of industrial policy. We're not even picking a sector. We're just picking a function of the economy where there's broad consensus in the economic community that research has big spillovers, that firms only capture about half of the, half of the benefits from research are captured by the firm conducting the research, the rest spill over to society, that's why we have kind of a credit there. But, if you again follow the debate to its logical conclusion, the logical conclusion is get rid of the R&D tax credit, get rid of accelerated depreciation, get rid of the domestic production deduction, everybody pays the same. So I'll just close by saying what would a corporate, what would a, what should corporate tax reform do? Uh, clearly there's a few little I should say little. There are certainly some case, some some areas where the tax code is, has things that are just put in there by lobbyists who had to have no effect on real innovation or growth or competitiveness. Sure, let's get rid of those. But we shouldn't do that at the expense. Our view would be we should be expanding the research and development tax credit from its current rate of 14% up to 30%. We should include workforce training in that, and we should include CapEx in that, create an investment tax credit. That would get the effective rate down well into the 20s. Uh, but at the same time, it would be spurring growth and, uh, and competitiveness. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ike. <coughs> uh, great. Thanks, Robin. I thank everyone for, uh, for being here. Um, one of the things uh, that we addressed at, at the end of our paper, um, and, and, and Rob kind of touches on this, I, I thought I'd begin with this, is there's so many economic um, fallacies out there, and I think there's not a tax policy that's so affected by some of these economic fallacies as the corporate income tax. And let me just give you a few of them that we've kind of dealt with over the years. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned the, the, the old Keynes trope that uh, uh, politicians everywhere are, are a slave of some defunct economist. And uh, you see this, um, it's something Rob kind of alluded to earlier, is that mercantilism, this whole idea exports are bad, imports are good, we need to set up policies to uh, kind of encourage both, to, to encourage exports, to discourage imports. Um, Economists kind of gave this up at least at least 200 years ago when Ricardo came about, probably even with, with, with Adam Smith, but the typical um, politician, I think, still has this kind of in his, uh, in his world build. And at the same point, we also have um, uh, this 
this whole idea of, of bloodism, right? The whole idea that if you make capital less expensive, then suddenly you're going to see some kind of shift towards capital away from labor, so you're going to have fewer people hired, you're going to have greater unemployment. Um, this, this perspective really colored a lot of, um, of, of tax policy, even, even into the 80s. And when I first started studying economics in the early 1980s, when the investment tax credit um, in the early 1980s was, was reintroduced by, um, by President Reagan, there was, was the real debate on this was whether or not you're just encouraging companies to lay off workers to hire more capital. And I think there's been a third one that, that's, that's really um, come up in the last five or ten years and, and, and started to kind of percolate in the, in the minds of people. And that's this notion of, of offshore outsourcing. That is, that the companies who locate operations abroad are doing so solely to displace U.S. workers with, with foreign workers. All of these ideas, I think, are, are wildly and incredibly wrong and, and have been disproven time and time again by economists, yet they still have um, a, a great influence on the U.S. tax code. And then just, I want to add just two more that, that, that um, I think Rob brought up today that, that we also talked about in this. Um, when Rob talks a little bit about um, um, what exactly does a tax expenditure do, Rob points out uh, correctly that um, on, on the corporate side, a lot of the things that, that we would call a tax expenditure are really done for value salutary reason. They encourage economic growth. And I think ultimately what we need to do, the, the judgment, the way we should judge any corporate tax code is does it increase um, economic growth? And the, the mistake I think a lot of people make when they talk about corporate tax expenditures, I think they conflate them with personal tax expenditures. And it seems to me in this town there's been a lot more effort trying to defend something like the mortgage tax deduction, which as far as I can tell has absolutely no economic, long-term economic impact at all, positive economic impact at all, and much less defending things like uh, bonus depreciation or um, um, uh, the research and experimentation tax credit. And one, one thing I'll, I'll just say, um, I just want to address Rob on the 2007 Treasury report. You know, I was one of the authors of the 2007 uh, Treasury report, and uh, the, we, we went around and around and around about exactly um, how to work within the constraints we were given by uh, the Treasury Secretary at the time, and that was to come up with something that was more or less uh, revenue neutral. And I, I think everybody from, from uh, Bob Carroll to Eric Solomon, I think uh, Michael Madaka, I think everybody really wanted to, um, their idea of a perfect tax code was to go to territoriality keep things like bonus depreciation, the research and experimentation tax code, and then figure out how to pay for and get down to as low a rate as possible. Um, and if you remember, one of the things that we suggested, which was wildly unpopular with, I think, everybody on both sides of the aisle, was to basically get rid of the corporate income tax or take it as low as possible and replace it with some kind of value-added tax. And I think from an economic perspective, um, it still makes a lot of sense. From a political perspective, the idea of putting some kind of personal consumption tax that from a conservative perspective, we worry it's very easy to increase and raise more and more and more revenue. I understand it's very pro problematic. But I think the, the point remains is that amongst professionals who I think study um, tax policy a lot, there is this idea that, that the rate is too high, we want to encourage economic growth. And then, more importantly, that when firms do operations abroad, those usually complement U.S. businesses and what they do here, they don't substitute it. In that 2007 Treasury report, um, one, of my, one of my tasks is to go around and interview uh, tax executives and other tax experts and try to get, uh, come up with a, a variety, of, first a variety of stories and examples we can use to illustrate the problems that the, um, that the tax code created. And um, to me, the most, two of the most telling stories, uh, one came from uh, Pepsi, we, we alluded to it briefly in the uh, in this paper. Um, Pepsi has um, tremendous operations abroad. Um, in, uh, in Poland, they, uh, they bought up all the old um, uh, soda bottlers and uh, potato chip plants, and then they put in their own brands. And then they've used that as a base to expand to, uh, to uh, Eastern Europe. And they are a, a presence to be reckoned with in, in Europe. But um, because of this, Pepsi employs a lot of people back in their headquarters in, in New York State who service these areas. You know, maybe as many as 500 to 1,000 people. 
most of the marketing is done in upstate New York. Almost all of the IT stuff is done there. Um, logistics, the logistics team is still located in New York. These are all high paying, um, highly technical jobs, the jobs that the communities crave to have, have more of. And you know, the, the question is, well, what would, if, if we could encourage Pepsi to, to do their production in the United States for, for Eastern Europe, what would happen? Well, you know, if you think about it logistically, you cannot produce Pepsi's, Pepsi's soda pop and potato chips and ship them a couple thousand miles across an ocean and be anywhere close to being cost effective, especially when you're shipping them to, to a lower cost market. It, it makes absolutely no sense at all. And so in the context of, of PepsiCo, um, trying to, say, get rid of um, deferral and put them in some kind of worldwide tax system simply makes them less competitive uh, operating in these Eastern European markets. It's not going to create any jobs at all. Um, we had a number of uh, people who told us back in 2007 uh, that basically their headquarters are here because of a, an historic accident. And that as long as, as the United States has a, a corporate tax rate 5 or 10 or 15 percentage points above what their competitors are, it's going to be more and more difficult to justify that, uh, keeping their headquarters here to, to shareholders. So we can always say, well, you know, people do a lot of talk. But when you start looking at the, the, the cost of human the cost of, of keeping a, a headquarters here, um, it becomes uh, it becomes more and more difficult to justify. Um, so let me quickly talk about what it is what we propose to do with this. Uh, again, we're, we don't pretend to be um, all encompassing. We're just trying to give people a, a flavor of, of what the general changes would be. And I, I think you know I've, I've been reading Rob's stuff for, for a number of years. So um, and he's to some degree Rob, Rob's the, the one guy on the. I guess he wouldn't call himself on the left on the center, but Rob certainly uh, uh, informed me on, on my tax view. But the first thing is that is that we we would reduce the rate. We we think that you cannot have the the, the second highest corporate tax rate, and, and Japan's already promised to reduce their corporate tax rate, and and remain competitive. Um, we're kind of agnostic about how far it should go. One thing we're not agnostic about is we reject the idea that you somehow have to pay for your reductions via um, uh, some kind of cuts in uh, corporate tax expenditures elsewhere. Um, I understand that it, politically it's really, really difficult to say, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to take other ways. We're, we're going to increase, decrease the revenue, decrease the tax rate, decrease the taxes we get from the corporate side, and possibly pick up some money from the personal side. Um, but to some degree, I, I think that's what we have to do. And the argument for that is, I think people need to remember exactly who pays the corporate income tax. Um, it's not the faceless, nameless corporations. It's, it has to be, by, by definition, it has to be one of three people. It has to be the workers um, via lower wages, or the consumers via higher prices, or it's got to be the shareholders viewer, <coughs> via a, a lower return they get on their investment. And the wealth of, of research on this seems to suggest that it's mainly the workers who pay. For, for a higher corporate tax rate. And even Jane Gravel. Jane Gravel is, is um, the biggest proponent of a higher corporate tax rate that, that exists on this, on this planet, I think. But even Jane Gravel's research suggests that if you make what people would consider pretty realistic assumptions about how, how the world works, you get the fact that the majority of the taxes is paid by the workers. So um, you know, one, of, one of our complaints about the tax code in general is what we try to do um, on the personal side, is that we try to do um, way too much social engineering. Um, it comes at a very high cost, and the reason we do it on the, on the tax front rather than do it through direct subsidies is simply because it's a little more opaque. Right? Um, but the corporate tax code is not a very... Increasing, raising a lot of revenue from the corporate tax code is not necessarily a great way to do it. It's not a great distribution way to tackle distributional issues. We need to tackle distributional issues outside of the tax code, for both on the personal side and, and the corporate side. So the first thing we would do is we would uh, we would re reduce the rates to some degree. Um, you know, if I were, if I, were I, I don't want to be the politician who, said, who tells you I'm going to reduce revenue and I'm not going to give you a single suggestion about how to increase tax revenue. Um, my one boogaboo is. Um, as I absolutely hate the mortgage income, mortgage interest deduction. Um, I have another paper coming out where I look at um, a, the 
the proportion of people who, who benefit from the mortgage tax deduction, and I'll just pick out um, Robin's neighborhood. I know Robin and I happen to be, uh, be from the same town in Peoria. I'm, I'm from Mossel, slightly north, slightly nicer place than where Robin's from. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, so I looked up, um, I looked at my, uh, my, my hometown. Exactly 9% of all people who live in Mossville, Illinois, take the mortgage interest deduction. Um, if you look at Nancy Pelosi's congressional district, 37% um, of those people in the San Francisco area and San Francisco suburbs take a mortgage interest deduction. Don't want to get off on, on, on a tangent, but this is not a subsidy that's helping people buy houses. It's helping rich people afford houses. Um, the second thing we would do in, in terms of reforming the income tax code is we would go to a territorial system. Um, I think we need to recognize that um, we want to encourage companies to operate Abroad, and I, I don't want to steal. Robin's going to discuss my paper. I don't want to steal one of Robin's anecdotes, but um, my my hometown of Mossville happens to have a bunch of, of Mossville um, um, operations there, and, and I can tell you, as Caterpillar has ratcheted up its proportion of sales abroad, the number of jobs in Mossville, Illinois, at Caterpillar has has gone up. In turn, in fact, something like a thousand new engineers have been hired at Caterpillar in Mossville um, in the last four or five years. So I can tell you that. At least one, one town is benefiting greatly from the internationalization that's, that's existing here. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, is uh, again, to, just to echo what Rob said, is that we do not want to get rid of um, things like the research experimentation tax credit. I will say this, I think we need to fix it. I don't think it's, it's terribly effective the way it is. I think we can um, um, not only increase the subsidy, but we, can, we should think a little bit harder about how to make it um, more effective. Um, and then uh, the bonus depreciation is something that, that we, uh, we really like and, and we argue needs to be kept in there, maybe even, even strengthened. Uh, reducing the cost of capital doesn't just benefit the capitalists, it benefits the workers. And that's a lesson we've learned over two or three centuries of economics and we need to remind people of that over and over and over again. Great, thanks Rob. Just a couple of thoughts on this, and, and clearly as Caterpillar has continued to expand outside the U.S., it has had a, a, a dramatically beneficial uh, impact within the U.S. on our employment. Um, and what we do see is you know, that the, the research and management of the company as our <coughs> operations in China expand creates a lot of opportunities for, uh, for U.S. employment. Uh, the, as I was saying, uh, go back about four years, our sales outside the U.S. were about 58% of our total revenues. Last year was up to about 70%. Uh, the foreign markets are growing much faster, so the likelihood is those percentages will continue to ratchet up. Uh, going, going a strong U.S. Uh, recovery will certainly be nice. Just, just a couple of thoughts on the, uh, on the proposals. You know, every company, as it's trying to expand its business and improve its profitability, analyzes uh, its investments. If it's an ongoing business, it's usually done through a budgeting process. If it's a, a new line of business or an expansion of investment into a new area, there's probably a very specific investment analysis that's being made. It may involve not just the investment, but where the investment will occur, where the money will occur. Now, almost everybody uh, that I know of in business does these types of analyses on an after-tax basis. And so uh, there are two things come into play. Cash flow is extremely important. Discounted cash flow is, I think, uh, pretty common across industry. Um, this is where incentives like a, a, uh, accelerated write-offs for capital investment, R&D incentives come into play because they reduce your upfront cash tax costs when you're making one of these investments. But another thing that does come into play pretty significantly is the effective tax rate on the company. And as the size of the investment ratchets up, um, then the CFOs get more interested in going beyond the effective tax, or beyond the uh, cash flow effect to make sure that you're not hurting your, uh, your long-term effective tax rate. And I think most companies then migrate in, into a, a, a longer-term investment now where the effective tax rate becomes uh, as important or more important than the, the near-term cash flow. And that's where you get this balance between 
uh, accelerated depreciation or upfront write-off uh, incentives uh, being somewhat offset by if you have a very high tax rate. Um, because in the end, then, if you're ratcheting up to a 35% rate, and especially as you're comparing to uh, foreign alternatives uh, for investment where the rates are significantly lower, the foreign investment uh, becomes uh, much more competitive than, say, uh, a, a U.S. side investment. And I kind of look then at, at the U.S. tax laws having you know, two parts. One being the domestic side, the, the corporate rate in the U.S. Um, that's really a U.S. issue in terms of drawing investment by businesses from around the world. The other side then is the foreign landscape, uh, particularly for U.S. companies operating outside the U.S. because of the worldwide tax system. Um, and, the, and the foreign side of it is, you know, on, on the domestic side, is what do we do to make the U.S. competitive with the rest of the world? What do we do to draw investment and new jobs into the U.S.? The other side of it is, is what do we really do in terms of the international markets to keep our U.S. companies competitive? Because having a worldwide tax system when no one else does, um, that, that has a significant impact on our ability to compete throughout the world. Because everyone now has access to capital. Not all the capital originates in, you know, from the U.S. Uh, the rest of the world is growing their capital base even more rapidly than we are. And so that, that element of competing outside the U.S., and we, we just, many of us just watched the, uh, the World Women's World Cup. I mean, we are a competitive nation in a lot of respects. But to some extent on our international tax policy, it seems that we've uh, we're trying to be isolationists. We're thinking we can roll ourselves into our own version of a global tax policy, and which makes us less competitive. And, and, and that's a bit of a disappointment because, as I look at the future strength of the U.S., you know, and I'll just wrap up with one other point. It goes to the overall tax policy. Some of it being these targeted exemptions, but um, when you look at some of these tax incentives, uh, all of them got put into law, I think, because we were able to, you know, we, the, the persons uh, pushing for them, uh, had good arguments as to why it would create uh, additional investment into a particular area. What troubles me, I guess, as a corporate tax executive is that uh, a lot of them then come back in, in the press to say, oh, look, uh, corporations aren't paying as much tax. Well, the fact is, it was because we were given incentives to invest in certain things. Uh, I'll use the low-income housing credit as, as an example. I mean, nobody is an in, uh, really is an industry uh, to build low-income housing. There is a separate industry for that, but you know, you really take advantage of the credit. It might end up reducing a corporate tax bill, but the fact is, is it was it was put there to get houses built for for low-income housing. It's not really a corporate uh, incentive in that sense. And, and so you really have to think about the implications of why things were put into the law. And is it really a reduction in the corporate tax rate, or is it really uh, to create an effect of getting additional investment in a particular area? And let's, let's make sense of the, of, of the incentives that are created. Um, and and you know, in that regard, going back to the 199 deduction and the production, I was pretty heavily involved in that. But as a major exporter, we were in this losing in, in, in the export incentives, and so uh, involved in how we would end up replacing that. I guess, it, it, and, and as Rob mentioned, it, just, it isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. And I think we should be thinking as we go forward, as we reduce the rate overall, which I think we need to do just in general, but really uh, for the types of jobs we'd like to and sent and you know, look, focusing on the tradable part of the economy. Do we need something that's not just uh, you know, the 199 deduction we have today, but something that's even more of a targeted incentive toward that tradable part of the economy that really is competing in, in the world economy, and which is what makes the U.S. a, you know, a stronger country and improves our standard of living, is that we're making goods that the rest of the world is interested in, it, it does a lot more for the, our standard of living and the growth of the jobs in the U.S. Great.
here. Good morning. I have a handout. I hope uh, you have it because you won't be able to read the, uh, the copy here no matter how high I, I hold it up. Um, I want to focus on uh, mainly the issue of revenue neutral corporate tax reform uh, because that is what the, the president has put on the, the table uh, and it, it is a uh, very uh, daunting challenge um, but it is a challenge that um, perhaps uh, if met would not be worth uh, the, the goal of improving the tax system and so let me walk you through that. Uh, I think it is very well understood that the U.S. statutory corporate tax rate has become extremely out of step with the rest of the world. So that's what uh, this first chart is showing. The blue line is the U.S. statutory corporate tax rate. This is OECD data. It is a combination of the top federal statutory rate and the average state rate. Of course, the state rate is deductible against the corporate, and that gets you to 39 to today. Uh, and the sort of reddish line is the average for the other now 33 uh, OECD countries. We now have 34 OECD countries. These are the more economically uh, developed uh, countries. And you can see that um, right after the Tax Reform Act of uh, 1986, there was a rather precipitous drop uh, in the, the blue line. Uh, so that brought us from 44% uh, down to around 38% uh, uh, combined uh, statutory corporate rate, uh, which went, then was 34% federal and average state rate. Uh, and so we leapfrogged ahead of the OECD. That was great. Um, since then, the federal statutory rate uh, was increased by one point uh, to 35%. But you'll notice that the other OECD countries reduce their rates, and uh, it is really striking. Uh, but the rate reduction has averaged about eight-tenths of a point per year, every year, over the last 20 years. So this gigantic gap has opened up. So now a 15 percentage point gap between the U.S. statutory corporate rate and the average for the other 33 OECD countries. Uh, to close that gap, you would need to reduce, if you did it all on the federal side, assuming the states don't cooperate, on the federal side, you need to reduce the corporate rate from 35% to 20 to close this gap. It's gigantic. Now, some might say, well, you know, a lot of those little countries don't really count, uh, so why don't we GDP weight this? Look at the big guys. And I didn't put it out here, but if you GDP weighted, the average for the other 33 OECD countries would be 30%. So that would mean we would need to drop the federal statutory rate by 10 percentage points to be even with the other OECD countries weighted by their economic importance. Okay, from 35 to 25. So this is really huge, and it's so huge that I'd say there's a bipartisan consensus that the uh, statutory rate is too high in the US. And as I think I pointed out, it's uh, the highest uh, in the OECD of all countries except uh, Japan, which uh, in fact uh, Prime Minister did promise to bring it down five points, and now they've deferred it because of the, uh, the tsunami. Uh, but uh, they still have not given up uh, on that, and I expect that when the economy recovers, they will. So the U.S. is maybe not number one, uh, number two, but number two uh, in a bad way. Notwithstanding um, you know, this very big difference in statutory rates, many have said, well, uh, although the statutory rate is high, the effective rate is low. Okay, so therefore, we lower the statutory rate, we can get more money out of the corporate sector uh, through you know, revealing various tax expenditures or uh, increasing uh, other uh, kinds of taxes uh, on the corporate side. Uh, and that won't hurt um, you know, the U.S. competitiveness. Just you know, to bring down the rate, do a revenue neutral, that'll make us more competitive. And the point that I'd like to make is that there are a lot of studies out there on what the corporate effective tax rate is. And I've summarized them, so this is page two. Uh, and what is absolutely remarkable is that 
no matter how you measure it, uh, and there are different ways that economists measure corporate effective tax rates, the U.S. turns out to be in the top quartile of you know, whatever peer group pretty much people look at, whether it's the OECD countries, the, the G20, uh, some people look at bigger, like you know, 80 countries and so forth. There are a whole bunch of studies out there. But the U.S. corporate effective rate is in the top quartile universally. Uh, it's remarkable. So you know, there's a Markle Shackelford study, which is the first one. Uh, they're using book tax rates. Uh, so this is uh, from financial uh, statements. And uh, they do something, they try to take into account that different countries have different mixes of industries, and some industries pay higher corporate rates than others, so they try to control for that. Uh, they have um, 16 countries, and the U.S. ranks uh, uh, 16 countries in 15 regions, I should say, so, uh, 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 in five regions, I'm sorry, 16 countries, five regions, 21 sort of comparators, and the U.S. book effective tax rates, two out of 21. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a study, uh, this was released by the uh, Business Roundtable. Uh, we looked at uh, the headquarters of the Forbes 2000. Uh, they were in 58 different countries for which data was available uh, in uh, the global CompuStat. Uh, we calculated book effective tax rates um, for the uh, largest countries in the world in these uh, 58 uh, countries, and the uh, U.S. Uh, effective tax rate, book effective rate, is 5 out of 58. Uh, we excluded oil companies because they tend to be taxed under different regimes in many countries. Uh, there's a World Bank study. Um, this is uh, called um, Doing Business Study, part of Doing Business, which is comparing how easy it is to do business in different countries. One part of that uh, comparison is taxes. Uh, and so there's a chapter in doing business. This comes out every year. And the analysis, it's more of a cash tax, okay? So book tax, as you know, is not the same thing as cash tax. This is more of a cash tax concept. They take, you know, a representative small manufacturing company. Uh, actually, PwC does some of the work for this. They put it in the largest city uh, in 183 different countries. They have an income statement and balance sheet for this company. And they calculate how much tax income, payroll, consumption, so forth, would that company pay? Okay, so you know, they give it to some accountant, you know, in PwC office in Shanghai or wherever it is, uh, and in every country they do that. And uh, if you look at this, um, within the OECD countries, uh, the U.S. came out three out of uh, 34 in terms of the effective tax rate. Uh, there's an academic, uh, Jack uh, Mintz, uh, and his co-author, uh, John Chen. Chan, uh, uh, Mintz is Canadian academic, very well known uh, in Canadian public policy circles. Uh, he measured something called marginal effective tax rate. So this is the present value of taxes on um, sort of a mix of investments, uh, plant, equipment, uh, inventory, um, uh, structures. Uh, so to take a representative mix, take a weighted average of the present value of taxes over the present value of income on a marginal investment that just breaks even. Called marginal effective tax rate. This was invented uh, by actually my uh, dissertation advisor at Harvard, Dale Jorgensen, along with Bob Hall. Very commonly used in economics. Um, so Mintz looks uh, at uh, a large number of countries, 83 countries, um, and what he does is he calculates marginal effective tax rates. He adds in other taxes on capital besides income. So he's looking at property tax, for example. Uh, and the non-recoverable VAT on purchases of equipment uh, in, in some uh, countries. Uh, and so he puts all of this um, together, and uh, the answer is, if you look at the 83 countries as a large group, uh, the U.S. is five out of 83 in terms of highest marginal effective tax rate. It turns out we're one out of 33 in the OECD and one out of seven in the G7. Um, AEI, Kevin uh, Hassett, who many of you know, has also looked at marginal effective tax rates and another concept called average effective tax rates. It's the same idea as you know, the plant uh, equipment, uh, structures, inventory, weighted average, uh, actually some debt finance, some equity finance. Uh, but this is um, the marginal effective tax rate is PV of tax over present value of income for the investment just at the margin that just breaks even, returns you know, the hurdle rate of the company. Average effective tax rate is for a company that is making you know, above normal profits. Uh, it's got some economic rents, you know, so it's not that last investment. You know, it's like, you know, maybe do I invest here in the U.S. or do I invest in, in China? Okay, it's looking at the overall profits of the company. It's not that last little machine that you put in. 
And the way this is done is, you know, uh, typically Devereaux, Michael Devereaux invented this at the Institute of Physical Studies, and he's looking at an investment that returns 20%, okay, not just, you know, the a marginal rate of return. And same thing, calculate PV to tax, <coughs> the present value of income. Uh, and so this is sort of more representative for many of the locational decisions that major multinationals make because, you know, they are making high returns on their intangible property, their, their patents, uh, their uh, uh, brand name, uh, their marketing intangibles, and so forth. Uh, so uh, the hassett mather study looks at OECD countries, the marginal effective tax rate, we're number five out of 29, average effective tax rate, we're second highest out of 29. European Commission um, commissioned a study on average effective tax rate. Uh, they went to uh, uh, a German economic uh, research firm uh, for this, uh, Center for Economic Studies. Uh, they looked at 27 European Union countries. Uh, and uh, three candidate countries to be members of the EU, uh, Canada, Japan, Norway, Switzerland, and the US. And uh, after doing all that, the US was second highest out of 35 countries. Uh, and then uh, the University of Oxford just came out with a study uh, that looks at the G20. Uh, the G20 is 19 countries plus the European Commission. So they looked at the 19 countries in the G20, uh, and uh, they looked at uh, average and marginal effective tax rates. Uh, average effective tax rate in the U.S. is second highest out of 19, marginal effective tax rate four out of 19. So uh, <coughs> picture tells a thousand words. This picture is a summary of all that. Um, so you can see the top is the U.S. Um, effective tax rate. These different studies, as I said, book effective tax rate, cash tax rate, average effective tax, market effect, you know, many different ways to measure this. The U.S. is the top, the peer group is the blue, and the difference, the gap, uh, is the excess of the U.S. corporate effective tax rate um, over the peer group. So we do not have a low, I hope I can we do not have a low corporate <laughs> effective tax rate. Uh, so, you know, if you lower the statutory rate and you increase, you know, the corporate tax base, so you keep basically the tax burden the same on companies, you are maintaining the U.S. at a corporate effective tax rate that is high by any measure with various peer groups um, of our competitors. So you might ask the question, well, why is it that you read so much in the newspaper that despite this high statutory tax rate, we have a low corporate effective tax rate? And there are plenty of you know, front page articles in the New York Times and other places um, that you know, assert this. So one reason that this has been mentioned um, is that if you look at corporate tax payments relative to GDP, the US is low. Okay. But why is that? Well, I wrote an article on that called The Corporate Tax Conundrum. And essentially the answer to that is this last chart. Uh, this is a, an OECD uh, data based chart. And what this shows is what percentage of business is unincorporated. Now that's the blue line. And for the countries where they had the, uh, the red line is what percentage of businesses with over a million of, uh, I think it's gross receipts, are unincorporated. Okay. And you can see that the U.S., uh, so the second bar you know, over here, you know, is Second highest in terms of unincorporated business, uh, taking all, but if you take the, the big over a million, uh, where all the action is, uh, the U.S. has by far the highest percentage of business that's in unincorporated form. In fact, uh, over 50% of business income in the U.S. is earned outside of corporate form. And, and this chart actually understates the fact that the U.S. we have S-Corps, okay? So they're not unincorporated, okay? So they're showing up here as corporate versus unincorporated, but S-corps are flow-throughs, they're tax-like partnerships, okay? So if we actually looked at flow-through business, the U.S. would be even more out of whack. So uh, if you went back to 1986, you would find that the share of unincorporated uh, business was about 20%, okay? It's now over 50%. So when the U.S. did corporate tax reform, we reduced our statutory corporate rate. We also reduced the individual rate. We reduced the individual rate to 28, the corporate rate to 34. We brought the individual rate below the corporate rate and created an incentive to move out of corporate form and all the states adopted limited liability statutes that let you have the benefits of limited liability like the corporation without paying corporate tax. So it was a huge move out. So when we compare ourselves to other countries, you look at corporate tax over the GDP, the corporate tax is paid by corporations but the GDP is including all this huge business sector that's outside of 
corporate form. So it's very distorted, uh, and so that is why sometimes you see very well-informed people say, oh, the effect of tax on corporations is low. It's not true. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you, uh, Peter and Robin. Uh, uh, great comments. Uh, we have about uh, maybe 15 minutes. We'll adjourn right around 9.45. So if folks have any comments or questions, you want to raise your hand and identify who we are and direct it to anybody in particular. Yes, sir. Um, I have one question. My name is Tom Keithley. Where is, uh, where is that in this conversation? You, you mentioned it briefly. In many of the countries that you were talking about, they also have got a pretty <laughs> So I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering, um, is it fair for you not to include the VAT tax in your in your work? Where does VAT tax sit in your general um, in the general topic? Is there you were mentioned like a you know like a four percent VAT tax or you know, something of that sort? I, I I would appreciate if you just sort of amplify where where the subject of that fits in. Your, your, your I'll be happy to take a crack at that. Uh, so yeah, every OECD country has a VAT except the U U.S. Uh, there are about 150 countries in the world now that have VAT systems. Uh, the U.S. relies on consumption taxes, federal and state, for about one-sixth of our total revenues. The rest of the OECD relies on consumption taxes for about one-third of their total revenues. We are much less reliant on consumption taxes, which means we are more reliant on income taxes because of that. And it turns out, first order of importance, tax mix. Okay, we can talk about how to design an income tax and you know so forth and how to move around the pieces, but a first order of importance, in my mind, is what is your mix of taxes between taxes on capital and tax on consumption, tax on labor. The OECD did really interesting study asking the question, does tax mix affect economic growth? You know, it's an important question. They looked at uh, the member countries of the OECD, about 20 of them, uh, over a couple decades. And what they found, very consistent with what economists believe a priori, is that the single most detrimental tax relative to economic growth, you know, these are sort of econometric analyses trying to control for a lot of things, is a corporate income tax. By far, the most detrimental, the single least detrimental tax for economic growth was consumption tax. And so, you know, if you're thinking about where we are, which is high effective tax rate on corporate capital, and saying, gosh, you know, you really want to do something about that, if you're thinking big picture, you would change the mix, which I think is what maybe Rob was suggesting, looking more to taxes that are least harmful to economic growth, like consumption taxes and less on the corporate side. But if you're doing revenue neutral corporate tax reform, that option isn't open to you. And, and that's very constraining. Any other comments? You know, I'll just say, in the, in the 2007 uh, Treasury report where we looked at replacing part or all of the corporate income tax with, with a VAT, um, I think all of us were convinced, as Peter said, and based in part on the stuff that Peter's done, that that would certainly be better for economic growth. But if you just think about the, the political constraints that, that we face. The, 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 the paper, by the way, the, the report did not get much attention, but the kind of the, the meme that was taken from that was, oh my God, these people want to increase taxes on consumers in favor of big corporations. So that's the gigantic political hurdle we have to face. Yeah. The other component of that is that the bats are border adjustable. So when a German company exports heavy equipment to the US, they're essentially getting that rebated they're not paying it, and when an import goes to Germany or any other country to do it, they pay the VAT. So it's essentially it's a tax on uh, it's a tax on our exports, if you will, and, and it's a subsidy for their exports. So that's another factor in why it's important. Yes. Hi, Joel Swardlow, University of Texas. I realize there's a textbook definition, but are you all meaning the same thing when we use the word growth? I'm using it in the context of increased uh, real output 
uh, particularly productivity. So you're not putting any components in like fairness, distribution, sustainability, anything like that? No, I'm not. Certainly when we're talking about growth, I'm, I'm, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that you do these things, you would get higher realization <coughs> growth. It's not to say that the fairness issues aren't an important issue that needs to be considered, uh, but that's certainly not what we were talking about here. I was. And the one point, I'll, I'll just reiterate, the one point I think people miss when they talk about corporate income tax is that having a high corporate income tax is not a way to soak rich corporations. It's the workers who end up paying the burden of the corporate income tax uh, through lower wages. And I think in general, if you want to solve problems like, uh, like trying to help the poor or distributional issues or to be able to have more social benefits, you need higher economic growth. You know, there's a, a great study that looked at the productivity gap between 1975 and, and 1995. There was about a generation where the historical productivity growth average of 2.5, 2.6% fell in half. And then, it and then it picked up again in 1995. Economists aren't quite sure what happened. There's, we have a number of hypotheses. We're not 100% sure. Had we kept that productivity growth, remember productivity growth is output per worker per hour. Had we kept that, for those two decades, our gross domestic product would be about $6 trillion higher than it is today. I submit to you, if we were producing $6 trillion more, a lot of the problems that we face that seem almost insurmountable wouldn't be problems today. I agree with everything I've said. I, I guess um, where I'm, perhaps we might disagree, although this luckily is not about individual but My view is I'd raise the individual income tax rates on, on wealthy people back up to 39%. Uh, and I'd use that money to lower the corporate rate because I don't think that has a big effect on growth, but I think the corporate rate has a huge effect on growth. Yes, sir. Maybe just follow on from that. I'm Jeff Vanderwolf in the Finance Committee, Senate Finance Committee. <clears throat> what, what do the panelists view as the correct approach to dealing with pass-through, you know, business income that's flowing through to individuals and being taxed in the hands of individuals? with all the incentives that individuals get, like the home mortgage interest deduction, et cetera. Do you, any of you propose something with respect to business income and pastors? You mean that it be treated in a different way? So yeah. I do. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be honest, I, I haven't thought through it hard enough um, to, to give you the answer. Um, you know, I, ideally, I don't like two layers of taxation, and to me, the S corp seems like like an elegant solution. But at the same time, I know there's a lot of um, areas where S corporations are, are for essentially one people and aren't really accomplishing what it is we want to accomplish. So, um, I'm not I'm not at all prepared to say we need to we need to end this. Um, but again, I haven't thought I haven't thought through it hard enough to give you um, my 100 percent sure what. I think another area where Ike and I would fully agree is I would, I would also advocate for getting rid of the mortgage interest deduction. I don't think it gets us anything other than distorts the housing market. But I do think that individual tax incentives that are in the corporate code, uh, you know, these, for example, uh, individual and S corps can take the RV credit. Uh, and, you know, that's fine, that's good. So I think there's this view that if, you know, you want to have each effective rate the same, but if you do certain incentives like an R&D tax credit, or one thing that we've proposed is expanding the R&D tax credit to a knowledge tax credit so that training your workers you can get a tax credit, which you can't today. Uh, that would affect companies, escorts, individuals. It would affect all, uh, all business enterprises the same way. I guess I'd just make an observation. Around the world, as I you know, showed in that chart, corporate tax rates have been dropping, plummeting, uh, you know, Germany for 50 percent to 15 percent. I mean, you're talking about dramatic, dramatic rate reductions um, in corporate taxes. And at the same time, there has been some element of base fraud, um, reducing depreciation deductions, uh, adopting capital capitals, things like that. The result of that has been interesting, which is that corporate tax revenues haven't fallen relative to the GDP. Uh, and part of that is that uh, businesses that were organized outside the corporate sector, when they look at these corporate rates that, you know, in Europe are often far lower than the top individual, 
rates, right? You know, top individual rates are you know, more like you know 40 percent and up, and corporate rates, you know, in Europe are now more looking like 25 percent. Um, when you look at those caps, um, it turns out that the unincorporated business are moving into corporate form, and so. Unlike the U.S., where it's been exactly the opposite, a lot of those unincorporated businesses operate in corporate form in Europe because it's better for them to operate that way. It is lower cost to operate that way. Uh, so, just an observation that if we were to lower the corporate rate and you know pay for it with base broaders that you know extend beyond the, the corporate sector, companies might find that they'd rather be operating in corporate uh, form and unincorporated sector would shrink. Just an observation. Other comments or questions? Okay. Well, great. Um, oh, this is a really interesting discussion, and I want to appreciate including uh, Robin and Peter for joining us as, as commenters. Uh, and uh, there are papers on the outside there, so uh, please join me in thanking everybody.